First, I want to give a shout out to my wife, uh, who is a CFO and navigator. Um, there's a saying that says, um, a ship is safest at port, but that's not what ships are for. As I get older, as I think everybody does, we're less adventurous. And so I'm glad my wife is willing to go on this adventure with me and be the navigator. She cooks, she sews, and she debugs network problems, and she puts up with my geekiness. Thanks for coming on the trip. I also want to acknowledge Vitaly Bragalevsky. Spasiba za vašu pomoš. I liked his book, and he answered a very important question here. We'll get into that. Here's my GitHub for this project. Here's my email. Uh, the GitHub has my F# -sharp version and my Haskell version. The F# -sharp version has a bug in the embedded interpreter, so I rewrote it in Haskell, and I'm not going to update the F# -sharp version. So this tells you about what's complete and what's not. I became more interested in the embedded interpreter than the fractal plotting portion of it. Uh, here's a quote. I, I wanted to mention a few things along the way about the existential elements of programming and um, things that we need to think about as a community to get a grassroots buy-in. So there's a quote in the Wizard of Oz that said, if he is a good wizard, he will serve. And I think having that humility of being willing to serve is very important. And I think if we uh, keep that in mind, we can make FP more mainstream. So I asked Vitaly a question, and he gave me a, an answer, and this is the quote from his email. Uh, I was kind of curious about how Haskell does things behind the scenes. And I wanted to, because I need to know this when I'm implementing my interpreter, and uh, I wanted to know how the funks work, and he said, a forced thunk is replaced with an indirection, which is a dynamic closure in memory, that references an evaluated value. The pointer to that thunk, now an indirection, stays the same as before at a later stage. An indirection can be garbage collected, and the pointer, all pointers, will be changed then. Well, when he gave me that answer, I felt like a hillbilly. This is really pretty intense, but I, I understood what he was talking about. The only thing I was a little fuzzy on is this idea of a dynamic closure, but I'll get into that later. Uh, so sometimes when I feel overwhelmed, I joke about I feel like a hillbilly. Sometimes when I'm working on esoteric things, like trying to figure out how to uh, do a mark and sweep garbage collector, it gets a little too much, and I feel like I just want to get out a mop and do the mop and, mop and sweep uh, algorithm. It's something I understand, or, or go for a walk or something like that. But anyway, speaking of garbage collection, I wanted to mention something. This is an embedded interpreter. I didn't implement garbage collection. I got it for free. But in a future version, I might want to implement a garbage collector, maybe in Rust. I don't know. And... Uh, so, uh, prototyping the garbage collector in Haskell is very useful because you can make sure it's reliable before you try a more low-level implementation. And it's interesting, the evolution, I'm an old-timer, I watched this evolve in the old lists from a mark and sweep algorithm where you had fragmentation, you'd run out of con cells, but you still had plenty of space in other areas. Then they said, no, let's have a common heap. And that got rid of the fragmentation problem. And then the next step was, let's have generation scavenging, because there's an observation that new objects die young, so if they survive one round of garbage collection, they're more likely to survive future rounds of garbage collection. So let's start shifting them to different generations, and we'll garbage collect those older generations less frequently. And I joke about uh, hillbillies. I have this mythological idea of the noble hillbilly who is a straight shooter. You can shake hands with him and not have to count your fingers afterwards. And uh, city people have city smarts, but to me, uh, the mythological hillbilly has uh, country smarts like uh, MacGyver. Uh, 
And this is actually very useful. I think we need to be very good at category theory and keep that a secret from the public. But we also need to be very good as uh, hillbillies in explaining technology so even a hillbilly could understand it. And also this is, comes in handy in the space station when things broke down. We had to have this kind of hillbilly mentality of being able to figure things out and fix things with duct tape and trash that happened to be laying around. And I think it's very important as designers to keep that uh, kind of smarts in mind. As uh, my wife and I drove here, we drove here, we're going to fly back. We kind of made a vacation out of it. I have an interest in archaeology. And I want to go philosophical here for just a moment because I find it interesting that the Anasazi had wheels staring them in the face, but they never figured it out. They rolled these logs into place. They, they had to have rolled them into place, but they never invented the wheel. They made beads. They dropped them. They must have rolled, and they must have thought, oh, they had a wheel staring them in the face. Never got that. They, they invented the pump drill. Even the Inca didn't have that, and that has a flywheel on it. It's brilliant. I couldn't invent something like that. This is crazy good hillbilly tech. But it would be the Chinese that would ultimately turn that flywheel into a wheelbarrow, and that would happen in 200 AD. I wonder how history would have been different if they had figured out the wheel. And I wonder if there's wheels staring us in the face that we are missing too. Speaking of which, Bertrand Meyer had this idea of design by contract. That's a very good idea. He was so close to reinventing monads with this idea because his idea was we need to be clear on what is the responsibility of the caller and what is the responsibility of the callee. And the thing is, if you're going to check for an empty container, it's not good to check for it at the call site, because then you have to have that check repeated in every call site. It's better to push it into the callee and have the callee do it. Then we only have to code it once. And then we can be sure that that one site will do it consistently. Because sometimes different call sites will do these checks differently. And sometimes the different call sites won't even do it at all, and then we have no reference problems. So, and also you get this if-then-else chaining that's really ugly. Monad solved this problem. So to me, Haskell functional programming is really cool because it has this hillbilly smarts in it. Forget the category theory. Oh, speaking of which, I do think we need to be very good about the category theory and as conversant in category theory as possible, but that shouldn't be how we try to sell functional programming. We really need to try to sell it as a, a way to solve uh, problems that the common man is uh, encountering on a day-to-day -day basis. As the Beatles used to say, uh, if you uh, go carrying pictures of chairman now, you're not going to make it with anybody anyhow. And I, for us, I, I think too much talk about category theory scares people off. Now, getting back to that quote from Vitali about a dynamic closure. I'm an old timer. I remember static versus dynamic scoping. That was a big issue in Lisp in the early days. So I, I had to ask him. I had a feeling that's not what he was talking about. It has nothing to do with that. And, and, and he answered this and said, uh, a dynamic closure in Haskell is an object in dynamic memory that is used by GHC to store any values. That's helpful to know that. Why do I care about this stuff? Because uh, I want to know how much support I'm going to get from Haskell when I implement Funks. Now, I can't get them completely for free. Well, sort of, maybe. Uh, but I get a lot of support from Haskell for them. And the, the nice thing about implementing things in a high-level language like Haskell is you get garbage collection for free. You get a help for uh, thunks. You get lists for free. You get uh, a lot of this math stuff you don't have to worry about. You can just snarf it. I like Scheme, but I always felt that it should have been lazy from the very onset. Um, now we have racket, which is kind of a pun, I guess, scheme, racket, I, 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 okay, so, but I remember in the early days, schemers would say, mutation 
and laziness don't mix. Well, I think that's a bit of a cop-out. Haskell proved that they can mix. You just have to be careful about it. And uh, I'm, I wish that Scheme had grappled with this early on and made Scheme lazy from the onset. But since I was doing it, I decided I'm going to make mine lazy. There's a lot of principles in Scheme that are very important. The first class citizenship idea, uh, least surprise, uniformity, elegant simplicity, called by uh, CC. That was uh, uh, current continuations. That, uh, continuation passing style, that was all pioneered by Scheme. Uh, the downside to Scheme is it's not type safe, and JavaScript has similar problems with this. For example, the empty list being false, that makes no sense. If, even if that's an optimization hack, or it, we shouldn't be doing stuff like that. We should let the compiler uh, people worry about that kind of optimization. We should be as uh, type safe as possible. My version of scheme, my lazy scheme, is uh, truly lazy. So my if function is a higher order function. You can pass it as an argument. And that was something that was very important to me. And I tried to make my version of Scheme as 100% type safe as possible, as much as latent typing allows you to do that. I also don't like macros because to me, it creates this intermediary. The code I write and the code I see in the debugger are different. And I, so I didn't like macros, so I decided no macros. I decided to get rid of these historical artifacts, the car and cutter. That's an interesting story behind that, but it's time to move on and use head and tail. Makes more sense. And for this version, I have no mutation whatsoever. And I like this joke about drinking funky Kool-Aid should not cause side effects. Closure is an interesting language, but it's not lazy. It's strict. I want it to be lazy. This application that this, uh, this, this language is embedded in, this lazy scheme interpreter is embedded in, is a, a function plotting program. That's why I call it plotting and scheming. That's a pun. This allows you to change the equation to be plotted at runtime without having to recompile. So that's why I call the project plotting and scheming. I use visual code. I use the three penny GUI. That's a very simple library. I think it's the simplest one because it uses HTML. Uh, it was invented by Heinrich Apfelmus. Uh, his name in German, I think, means applesauce, and that's why his logo looks like an apple that's turning into applesauce. Testing is really cool in this system because if I want to see if I broke my system, I just run a plot. And if the plot looks good, I have some kind of confidence that I didn't break things too badly. So it's a nice test case. Uh, and um, here's, I, I show the, uh, this is uh, in this diagram. This is the actual um, Y Combinator. And I wanted to be able to run the real Y Combinator, not the applicative order Y Combinator. In a lazy system, you have this version of the Combinator, which is simpler. In a strict system, it looks different. It looks ugly. I want to be able to run this one. And for me, this is a great test case. The Y Combinator isn't just of academic interest. It's interesting for test purposes, because if you write an interpreter that can run the Y Combinator correctly, that's a good test of how solid your interpreter is. Very pragmatic. We don't have any formal benchmarks yet, but I can tell you the Y Combinator runs, and it runs very fast, virtually instantly. I'm not going to do a demo here. I'm going full hillbilly just to preclude problems and save time. Uh, but um, when I run the plots through the embedded interpreter versus the built-in ones, if I were to show it to you and say which is which, you probably wouldn't be able to tell because they are both so responsive, you wouldn't be able to visually tell the difference between them. So it's reasonably performant. There's a lot of optimizations I can make that I haven't made yet, so I'm going to improve that. But right now, I'm very happy with the uh, performance. This started out in F-sharp. I had a bug in my F-sharp 
embedded interpreter, and I couldn't figure it out. So what I started to do is I started to prototype in Haskell and then backport to F sharp. There's something about the purity of Haskell that makes you get clear in your thinking about what it is you're expressing. And a lot of times the bugs in your code just vanish just from that, just from rewriting into Haskell. Well, I, when it came to these problems and I started doing this more and more, I thought I'm just gonna leave it in Haskell and not backport, so I'm not gonna go back to F sharp at this point. Here's some of my favorites of Haskell that make life so much easier for me. It's equational nature, it looks like prolog code, very declarative. Here's an example, this is actual, from, actual code from my interpreter, symbols to labels. And you can see you have these iter, uh, there's the type, declara type declaration, which is documentation. This is my way of saying, this is what I think the type should be and see if the compiler agrees with me. That's nice that I can do that. And then here I get to specify all the different uh, shapes that iter can take in terms of the arguments that it takes. And this nature, this equational nature of Haskell is the biggest thing that helped me rewrite my interpreter and get rid of the bugs that were in it. This is so helpful. And I, again, I mentioned the three penny GUI. This made the GUI part really simple. Scheme, here's some of the things I like about Scheme. I love X, S expressions. S expressions are essentially like an untyped version of XML. And you use them for both code and data. If I'm writing code that I'm gonna to have to read later, I wanna use Haskell syntax, the very parsimonious syntax, the uh, indentation sensitive nature of Haskell. It makes my code easier to read. But if I'm writing code that's gonna be consumed by other code, I don't want indentation sensitive uh, formatting. I want the S expression formatting because it's easier to write code that consumes that. And it makes the interpreter very simple. You know, an interesting story is uh, John McCarthy supposedly said that he intended to give Lisp a proper syntax and he had just intended S expressions just to be an intermediary language for his abstract syntax trees. But when he implemented it, it just kind of caught on and people got used to that S expression syntax and so the, he didn't bother with the next phase of creating a proper syntax. Haskell would do that later. The Haskell people hate the parentheses and they try to do everything possible to get rid of parentheses and make things as sparse as possible. I thought I'd mention a few things about combinators. I have always been fascinated by combinators, especially the X combinator. Just curious, how many people have heard of the X combinator? Oh, good. Okay, so this, we used to play a game in the early days of Lisp. What's the most minimal implementation of a programming language you can do that can express everything that is computable. In other words, Turing complete. Uh, and this is an interesting uh, question, not just for an academic reason, but if you're writing an interpreter, you wanna bootstrap it as quickly as possible with the least amount of primitives as possible to get the thing running and then worry about the rest as later, uh, later libraries and so forth. Well, the, one of the extreme versions of this minimalist game is the X combinator. Imagine having only one combinator in your system called X. You can have as many X's as you want. You can parenthesize them any way you want, but that's all you have to work with. But it's still Turing complete. You can express everything that is computable with the X combinator. And this is interesting, this is another hobby of mine is origami. If you've seen the unicorn out on the front table, that is done with pixel unit origami. And pixel unit origami is very 
much like the X combinator of origami. You just have one unit to work with. The pixel unit has two pockets and two tabs. That's it. That's all you have to work with. And yet you can do interesting things like this. This is an interesting, interesting case study for me because this makes me think, gee, how does Mother Nature do her programming? Remember, C, T, A, G, DNA, four primitives. And yet, Mother Nature expresses incredible genetic information using C, T, A, G, four primitives. So, at also the risk versus CISC, remember, reduced instruction set uh, computers versus complex instruction set computers. The risk computers had very few primitives, but they ran them very quickly and the CISC was more complicated and more expressive. Uh, I think this idea of having few primitives but having powerful primitives is a very powerful thing. And the fact that Mother Nature herself uses this is very interesting to me. By the way, if people are interested in this stuff, uh, there are a lot of people here that do some origami and we're gonna do some origami uh, in the hallway and I posed a mathematical problem I showed the folding of a simple origami envelope and posed the problem. How would you come up with an equation that can predict the size of paper you need to start with to get any given size envelope? And somebody's working on that now. If they solve this problem, uh, they will be the first person in the world who has ever solved this problem as far as I know. So this is kind of fun. This is, this is, this is really functional programming with origami. So it's, it's kind of interesting on the sideline. I thought I'd mention something important too about Haskell that, uh, and, and I found this very interesting. I was talking to one of Haskell's greatest luminaries. I don't want to drop any names, but they're very, uh, um, they do a lot with Haskell. And I mentioned, you know, Haskell does not have let semantics, not scheme let semantics. The semantics of let in Haskell is really what in scheme would be called let rec, recursive uh, let. And I, I, th this person said, you know, I never thought about that. You're right. And I thought that's interesting. So I just thought I'd point it out because I think it's very interesting that Haskell has let rec semantics. But I think the reason why they do that is they have no choice. Because you can express things in a very equational, rule-based sort of way, those things have to be mutually recursive, and therefore you can only really support let rec semantics. So I think that's what's going on there. I think it's kind of interesting to be aware of that. One of the things that uh, I want to do in the future uh, is to allow more of a lazy scheme to be bootstrapped. I want to have the smallest core possible and move everything else off into libraries. One thing I want to do is I want to have a primitive called raw. And I would be defining that. Uh, that means that I could, my quote function in scheme, then I could define it as a user-defined function and it would look like this, define quote as lambda x raw x. So if I had a primitive in my system called raw x, that's my way of saying, I want you to give me the raw value of this without evaluating it, and then claim that for thunk purposes, it has been evaluated, but the evaluation of it just happens to be the raw value. And this would be very useful, and then I could define a lot of things like let, let rec, and so forth. Uh, in my interpreter using this. In my interpreter, I don't have any special forms. In scheme, things like uh, let and let rec, these are often uh, special forms. Uh, they are not first class citizens. They're not first class functions. You can't pass them as arguments. In my system, you can. You can pass if as a function. You can pass let as a function. You can pass let rec as a function. This is kind of crazy, but I really wanted to take this idea of first class functions uh, really seriously, even more seriously than the scheme community itself takes it. Because for me, it was easier to implement it as a first class function than to implement it as a macro or a special form. <laughs>
Uh, the bibliography, uh, I want to mention a few things that I think are very noteworthy. The uh, SICP book, Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs, uh, has scheme and scheme. Uh, this is a very useful exercise. I'd like to see it have uh, Haskell in scheme. I think that would be very interesting. I'd like to see Haskell in Haskell. These are very useful exercises in order to understand the nature of these languages. Uh, the book or the art of prologue in the old days, prologue used to transform down into Lisp. Lisp was used like a really low level language. I think that's very useful, very helpful to do that. And I'd like to see uh, um, a version of Scheme that is powerful enough to allow us to write Haskell. And I think that that would have to be a lazy version of Scheme to allow us to do that. And uh, that is part of why I wanted to make my version of Scheme lazy. Somebody had a talk and they mentioned this book, A Theory of Objects, by Luca Cardelli and Abadi. And I thought this was very interesting, and I, I wanted to mention this, because I think as the most primordial thing we can possibly conjure as, as computer scientists is the notion of a function. To me, everything is a function, and objects are built from functions. Well, this book takes the opposite uh, approach and conjures a, objects as being the most primordial thing and then the question then becomes how do you implement functions if objects are your most primordial thing well he didn't convince me that objects are more primordial than functions but i thought it was interesting to read through this book and uh, be exposed to that i thought, I thought it was kind of uh, illuminating so I have some conclusions here, and I'm way ahead of time, actually, even though we started late. So we'll have a, a longer Q&A session, possibly. I think schemes should have been lazy from the very onset. And I think we should have a lazy version of scheme that we can use as an assembly language, a low-level language that we write other languages in. Uh, and whether they're performant or not doesn't matter. The point of it is it's a form of denotational semantics. We want to get clear on what these language constructs mean. And uh, by implementing them, you really come to grips with what's going on in a way that you would otherwise not understand. Scheme is a wonderful embedded programming language. I love Haskell, but I would not want to try to use Haskell as an embedded language. It's just too complicated and too big. And the syntax of it is not easy to deal with. It's nice for humans, but if you're doing code-to-code -code transformations or writing an interpreter, the S expressions of Scheme and Lisp, uh, I think, are a very, very nice. One of the things I want to do in the future is to create a Lambda Calculus interpreter. The fact that Scheme has more than one argument in the argument list, that's not a problem. It's not curried. But I could use that if I was writing a Lambda Calculus interpreter. For example, here's this Lambda Calculus expression. Lambda x, y, z, and then you have some expression. That's actually a shorthand for a lambda x dot lambda y dot lambda z. Well, since I'm doing scheme, I could represent this as lambda x space y space z. And then do a transformation to the curried form. So it's, it's a, a really nice hack that would make writing a lambda calculus interpreter a lot easier. Then I just have to do a syntax a syntactic transformation from lambda calculus syntax to scheme syntax, and then I've got a lambda calculus interpreter that is lazy normal order. <laughs>
The other thing I want to say, the interpreter pattern is a very, very powerful thing. I think going forward, we're going to see more of this. We've already seen a lot of this. But I think you're going to see this even more and more in the future. For example, I'm very involved in music notation software. And if you want to extend the music notation software, there's a scripting language. Usually the scripting languages aren't very good. I wish they were more like Scheme, so more expressively powerful. But that allows you to add things <coughs> to the music notation software, for example, that the designers never put in, or correct things that you think they did wrong, or many other things. And this gives you a chance to, uh, in my equation planning, to change the equation at runtime without having to recompile the code. And I think that's extremely important and very powerful. So I'm way ahead of time. I, maybe I drank too much coffee. But I'm going to open it up for questions ahead of time. Yes. Okay, I'm, it's going to be a tough one to try to recapitulate that because I'm supposed to repeat the question. Okay. So I, let me see if I'm on the same page with you. You're saying macros are maybe not so bad because they allow you to do a lot of the transformation. And maybe you could even get laziness by using macros to do a transformation. Is, is that kind of what you're asking? Yes. Okay. I, I know I have the mic, so I'll just repeat. Yes. So... I mean, essentially, what makes it what makes something lazy is that you've you've uh, you've put a, a block around it. And essentially, you don't get the value unless you evaluate. And evaluating a primitive returns the primitive. Evaluating um, evaluating anything a, a function requires the function to be evaluated at that time. So you could basically put you put eval blocks around essentially everything. And then they need to be evaluated. They only get evaluated if the program requires the actual value itself. Uh, I understand what you're saying. Mm -hmm. And indeed, you're not the first person that has said that. A lot of schemers have been using macros for a very long time to get the effects of laziness. But I would, I, there's a lot of reasons why I don't like macros. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I'll go through one of them again, just to kind of recapitulate. To me, I never liked macros ever on the Symbolics List Machine or any, any places I've ever found. Because I always felt like I'm writing code, and then I see the macro expander, and it's just like this unrecognizable gobbledygook that I, it's not, even to try to, have pointers into it and map it back and forth to write a debugger, for example. That's a really tough problem. I, and then you're, and, and if you fall into the debugger, you're looking at code that you didn't write. The macro expander wrote it for you, and I don't even recognize that. I wrote this code, but I don't even recognize my own code because the macro expander did all this crazy stuff with, I'm lost. I mean, I'm totally lost with that. And it's another phase, too. You have the compile phase. Uh, the, the, w this, this is the so, so your answer is yes, you're possibly doing the right? Well, that's one part of it, but I don't think it's quite the same thing. I think there's a lot of stuff you get in a truly lazy language where the, the laziness is at the core of the semantics that you can't imitate with macros like infinite data structures and things of that sort. Um, Haskell will evaluate up to the first constructor and then it stops. Trying to imitate all that with Max, I would not even want to attempt that. 
Yeah, so, uh, and Haskell has Haskell templates, so we can't turn it back to on macros. There's a lot of things you can do with macros, and so I, I don't want to say uh, they're not useful or anything like that. It's just they don't fit with my comfort level, uh, and so that's why I avoided them. In future versions of my scheme, I might actually do something like template Haskell, but that's way, way down the line. Uh, I've just, I just, my sensibilities as a programmer, I never liked macros, and that's why I don't even have special forms in, in my uh, version of Scheme. So, but I, I do appreciate your question, and, and there's a lot of other people that feel the same way. Okay, all right. Anybody else? Maybe I should ask you folks some questions to see uh, what you think of the idea of a one ring to bind them all type of idea of um, having a language like Scheme as a low level language that we can express Scala, Haskell, and other programming. What do you think of that? Yes. Yep. Yep. Right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And certainly Scheme is, is even more so Scheme is much closer to la being Lambda Calculus in a more direct way. Um, yeah, definitely. Um, if I might ask then. Uh, sure. But sure. Um, yeah, you have a low level language in, in Scheme, but how would that be translated efficiently to the hardware implementation when you have to consider details like state registers Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes, that's the beauty of having an embedded interpreter. You don't have to worry about those things. But as a second phase then, and when you start to make it a language that is standalone on its own, that's when things like Rust maybe are a good idea. And we have to start thinking about writing garbage collectors and so forth and so forth. But if you start with a, 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 an interpreter like I did, you can verify the correctness of it and that helps guide you in implementing it in a different languages, uh, different languages that have lower level concerns where you, you do care about registers and so on and so forth. Uh, that's when you get into compiling this and I'm, I'm not even getting close to that in this particular project, obviously. But that's not something that uh, I take lightly. That's, that's important. But I think if you come up with a really good interpreter, it makes writing the compiler later a little, hopefully, less painful and so forth. And you can have a reference interpreter. You say, this thing runs in my little interpreter here, but when I implement it in Rust and with my garbage collector and all the low-level details, that one doesn't match my reference interpreter. Where's, where's the problem? So it can help guide you in debugging your compiler and and uh, things that, and, and verifying correctness because it's the interpreter is essentially like a denotation of semantics and that's all i'm trying to get from it uh, yeah thank you good question